Thank you very much. And um, I'm excited to speak to you about some of the research models that we, we can take um, to try to understand in more detail some of the interactions between the vaginal microbiota that uh, Kelly just spoke about and bacterial vaginosis and sexually transmitted infections. Um, and as Katarita mentioned, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of Perfectus Biomed Group. So a few slides just about our group. Our, we have two laboratory sites. One is located in um, the UK, in Darsbury, just outside Manchester, and the other one in the US. And we're a group that has come together to harness our innovative science and our approaches to improve people's lives by working collaboratively with our partners, um, our clients to drive their product innovation and help them commercialize their technologies. And we've got experience uh, conducting this research in different geographical areas, whether North America, South America, uh, Europe, UK, and, and Australia. Our history of, of our group is really where two companies that have come together. Originally in, in 2012, Perfectus Biomed was formed by Samantha Westgate with a strong background in biofilm research. And the company is, is very much, the foundation of our company is um, the quality. And so we're ISO certified and over the years have gone on to become ISO 17025 and GLP compliant uh, is in the UK, as well as in the, in the US, we are also ISO 9001 certified. Uh, I was the founder of Extend Biosciences, the, the second company of the group. And in 2020, we merged our two companies to be leaders in the development of preclinical research uh, with, with the innovative approaches and also with the strong expertise in biofilm research. So Kelly teed up my presentation really nicely. Um, so a little bit of background, yeah, just to describe bacterial vaginosis as it pertains to biofilms. She mentioned how common this is in, in women 18 to 49 years of age. The prevalence in the United States is, is estimated to be 30% um, each year. And it develops, obviously it was a disruption in your normal uh, flora where your lactobacillus species will decrease and in, in the anaerobes start to increase, specifically Gardnerella, which has been um, isolated in biofilm format from up to 90% of epithelial surfaces of, of BV vaginal biopsies historically. And there's a nice review article and research article that demonstrates on the, on the panel on the right, showing that as the Gardnerella vaginalis can grow on a biofilm on the surface of the vaginal epithelium, but as it also can grow in multi-species and polymicrobial biofilms, she mentioned um, Enterococcus faecalis can, can co-mingle with, with Gardnerella and also change the profile of some of its virulence uh, expression, such as its vaginal lysis and others. So definitely becomes problematic, difficult to treat and um, recurrent. And then there's Neisseria gonorrhea, sexually transmitted infection with very much a, go, a global impact. 30 million cases worldwide estimated in 2016. It's developed antibiotic resistance to all classes of antibiotics used to treat this organism. And it too can form a biofilm on cervical epithelial cells as shown in panel B, which was um, a scanning electron microscopy image um, showing the nice gonorrhea growing over four days on the surface of human cervical epithelial cells. And then bacterial vaginosis is also a strong predictor of also having nice gonorrhea or chlamydia infections. So these things, these uh, infections go together. So maintaining the normal floor is important to understand how they interact is, is optimal for maintaining health and creating therapeutics to promote a healthy microbiome. Um, Kelly also mentioned this article that came out in 2011. Uh, Jacques Ravel led that group. And I mentioned this because this is some of the research that led out of this paper in collaboration with Dr. Ravel. Uh, she mentioned the, the five different community groups from that study, from, from the different ethnic groups that were studied in these uh, reproductive age women 
with group one being dominated by Lactobacillus crispatus. And I've highlighted there the, the group four, which was the, the diversity group. And that the thing that I wanted to present here and to know is that in the crispatus group, pH was also um, collected and reported. And so the pH in the Lactobacillus crispatus group was approximately four. In the more diverse group, it was higher, five and a half approximately on average. And it was also associated with a high Nugent score, meaning seven to 10, you've got low lactobacillus and, and high uh, background of, of um, Gardnerella. So how do we maintain this, the solar pH? How does, how does lactobacillus crispatus maintain that low pH preventing um, colonization or outgrowth of Gardnerella and other infections? So Dr. Ravel and our research team collaborated together to develop an ex vivo vaginal mucosal model. And we wanted to explore the mechanistic role of lactobacillus species in affecting the colonization of the vaginal mucosa by uh, Gardnerella, Gardnerella vaginalis and Neisseria gonorrhea. And we had a, quite a bit of experience in developing these ex vivo tissue models. And one of our go-to mucosal models is derived from porcine mucosa. And I'm showing you this cross-sectional histology image of the comparison of a human mucosa, vaginal mucosa um, with the stratified squamous epithelium at the top and the lemon appropriate below. And it's very similar to the porcine mucosa. So it allows us to get a source of ex vivo skin or, or mucosa. It's very similar to human, it's readily available and we can get it into the lab. And we've developed protocols and methods for utilizing this tissue, this mucosa. We create small explants from a sheet of the mucosa. This is live, viable, healthy mucosa that's obtained and utilized in the laboratory within hours of obtaining this from animals that, that would be, um, they're harvested for hum meat for human consumption. And then we basically get the mucosa, which would normally be discarded. And then we grow them. This is very important on the bottom um, lower panel and panel four. We are able to grow the explants with mucosal side up on the surface of a trans well, and then there's media down below to, to, to support the viability of the, of the mucosal tissue over days to week. And that media then can also be sampled. So one of the first things we set out to do is to look at biofilm growth of Gardnerella vaginalis or Neisseria gonorrhea over time. And so what I'm showing you in the upper right-hand panel is control tissue. And if we stain this by live dead staining, so if the cells stain green, they're viable. If they're red, they're not viable. And we tracked this over 96 hours. Gardnerella down below was seeded at a lower density and allowed to then grow over time on the surface of the mucosa. The left-hand panel is showing you the total colony forming units that it grows up to over time. And then the imagery, the confocal microscopy is showing you panel E through H, the formation of the micro colonies and then further extensive biofilm formation that is occurring over that time period. The epithelial mucosa below, as you can see, is those cells are turning red uh, so that the bacteria itself is cytotoxic to the cells, potentially due to the secretion of the vaginal lysin. Nicaea gonorrhea as well was studied in the same manner um, with the control panel at the top, I through J, the mucosal staying viable, that was uninfected. And then when it was infected with Nicaea gonorrhea, we also saw biofilm formation over time. It just looks like a lawn of growth on the surface. So we needed to do this such that we could then come in with lactobacillus and see, see how the effect that it would have. So one of the first things we did is we took a lactobacillus crispatus um, strain or isolate from the microbiome study and we tracked its growth over time on the surface of the mucosa. And then the hypothesis at the time was to look at the importance of lactic acid, also as Kelly mentioned in her talk, on the how that would affect the growth of Gardnerella or Neisseria gonorrhea. And so we supplemented the 
culture media on uh, below the, the mucosal tissue with lactic acid to push towards that pH of four, which we found was the pH that was intravaginally in the women where they were predominated by lactobacillus crispatus. And once we reached the, the, the pH of four with the lactic acid, it inhibited the growth of Gardnerella vaginalis at 48 hours, as well as Neisseria gonorrhea. But it didn't have any effect on the growth. In fact, the growth was actually enhanced somewhat in the lactobacillus crispatus organisms. So once we had that bit of data, we created a cold culture experiment. So using that same strain, we added lactobacillus to the surface of the mucosal cells. So I want you to look at panel A, and we track this over time, a zero hour time point, 48 hours of which Gardnerella was then added to a already um, in colonized surface of vaginal mucosa. And then 96 hours later, or 48 hours after the addition of the Gardnerella, we determined several things. The pH of the media that was in our, in our bottom of our well underneath our membrane and the overall effect of the growth of Gardnerella in the presence of this lactobacillus crispatus strain. A couple of things are noted. In the controlled culture media, and this is unbuffered media, in the controlled buff media, if you go the, the CNTL column, our pH and our culture media shifted minimally from 7.5 7 to 6.5. We didn't expect it to shift very much. These are uninfected mucosal samples. The lactobacillus crispatus growing on the cells did not shift our culture media down to the 4.4 as we were hoping or expecting, but that was um, a finding that perhaps um, we needed to have more time or we needed to have uh, more lactobacillus crispatus growing on the surface. And so therefore, when we challenged with Gardnerella, it wasn't quite enough to reduce the, the overall growth of Gardnerella. We saw about a log, log and a half reduction in the Gardnerella. However, it wasn't quite the low enough pH to inhibit its growth as much as we anticipated. So what we ended up doing is we, we um, developed a protocol where we condition, preconditioned the media. So we grew the lactobacillus in broth culture and then we sterile filtered that culture. So it would contain the, the lactic acid that it produced. And we conditioned the mucosa with that for an hour and also placed that uh, conditioned media underneath the, the trans well in the sun buffer media for starting concept, starting pH of 5.5. So now at time zero, we're at 5.5, we add the lactobacillus crispatus and by 96 hours, we had a pH of 4.0. At the 40 hour time point, the pH with the lactobacillus colonizing was at four. We challenged with Gardnerella and we saw a significant reduction overall in the growth. In fact, it didn't grow at all. Uh, the lactobacillus plus Gardnerella had, had no, the growth was the same as the challenged amount that we put on the mucosa. The pH where we just had Gardnerella alone was at five, was at five. And then the other thing we did is we looked at underneath the, the culture media that was down below, we collected that at the end of the study. And we were able to determine the overall lactic acid production by the lactobacillus crispatus. And we looked at the enantiomer, the D lactate versus the L lactate that was produced. And there was more D lactate produced versus the L lactate. And that was uh, significant if you look at the across lactic acid versus only Gardnerella or only our starting culture media. So two things that the lactobacillus was producing the lactic acid, which was having this effect on the growth of Gardnerella and also that the D-lactate was important. For Neisseria gonorrhea, we ended up supporting and preconditioning the media with lactic acid itself to get to that pH starting pH of 5.5 at time zero. And then we then challenged uh, with Neisseria gonorrhea at the 48 hour time point. And we were able to see that this as well, this pH as well was able to reduce or inhibit the growth of the Neisseria gonorrhea on the vaginal mucosa. 
So in conclusion, we developed an ex vivo model to help understand and characterize the necessary environment that the succidic environment that inhibited the colonization of this live Azure mucosa by Gardnerella and Isuria gonorrhea. And, and, and even before that, we the first bullet point, we were able to develop the ex vivo mucosa model to promote the growth of biofilm, both for Gardnerella and Isuria gonorrhea. As we know, these biofilms are very difficult to treat. So then this becomes a, a tool for future development of therapeutics or probiotics that are being developed to disrupt a, a fully uh, developed and mature biofilm. Crispata's colonization of the live vaginal mucosa was able to prevent this colonization in this pH dependent manner. And it also identified that the D-lactate was produced predominantly over the L-lactate, as now has been and further proven out uh, in other research studies. The ex vivo vaginal mucosa model then becomes an alternative model for research, investigating the mechanisms by which Gardnerella and Neisseria gonorrhea biofilms form, characterizing Gardnerella vaginalis in an expanded mixed species biofilm. So it allows us to, to now take this a step further, co-culturing Gardnerella with other bacterial species. And as I mentioned, helped identify lead candidate therapeutics for the treatment or prevention of bacterial vaginosis and other sexually transmitted infections. And finally, back to, go click forward, back to uh, Dr. Ravel and his work, the, it, noting the importance of lactic acid um, for significant portion of time, it was understood that hydrogen peroxide was produced by lactobacillus, and it was thought that this was the most important component of its antimicrobial properties. And now it's been clearly um, identified that it's lactic acid that is promoting these benefits. And there's been therapeutics that are in development and in clinical trials because of, of these important characterization studies. <clears throat> 